recently have become available. She uses images from US government spy satellite programs with names like Corona, Lanyard, Argon. These names are in all caps, ostensibly because they are acronyms, although everybody knows that in truth, the US government puts those words in all caps to scare people. Um, but Sarah has not been intimidated. She also uses a laser imaging technology called LIDAR, which is another all caps acronym. That one stands for light detection and ranging. She has benefited from NASA's space archaeology program, which like most of you, I had no idea that NASA was involved in archaeology. But they fund archaeologists to apply satellite data sets, and Sarah has made brilliant use of such resources. She's used these various modern tools to find pharaonic Egyptian temple forts and medieval Viking longhouses and ancient Roman amphitheaters. So today she's going to explain some of these tools and acronyms to us, um, but I think what really distinguishes her is not the Marshallton trowel or the fact that she knows what LIDAR and Lanyard and Argon mean, it's the fact that she can explain these things. She's a wonderful communicator. She was taught by some of the best in the field. As an undergraduate at Yale University, she studied under William Kelly Simpson, a beloved professor who inspired many generations of students. And at Cambridge University, she studied under Barry Kemp, who is truly one of the great Egyptologists of our age. And Sarah has applied the lessons of these elders to the technologies of her generation. And she's been able to find ways to communicate the excitement of discovery to millions of people. She appeared on the Stephen Colbert show and seemed very calm and did, and did phenomenally well. She's had lunch with the great archaeologist Indiana Jones, um, <laughs> AKA Harrison Ford. Um, very impressive, he, better than space. Um, and in 2016, she won the TED Prize, a grant of a million dollars, which she used to launch a project called Global Explorer. She's currently a professor of anthropology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We are very fortunate to have her here at Jaipal. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Parkett. So Sarah, um, yeah, I know from your book that you wanted to be an archaeologist since you were a child. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? What was it that attracted you to this field? So like so many children in the 1980s, um, you know, I got to see uh, the Indiana Jones movies when they came out on VHS. My poor parents had to suffer through me watching those movies again and again and again. Um, and that was one inspiration. Of course, um, National Geographic, seeing those magazines come every month, I would race to our mailbox and open them up and, and just hope that there was a story on Egypt. And also, uh, I think the King Tut exhibit was coming through the, uh, the US again. So I just grew up loving Egypt, um, which is a little odd for a, a, a girl from Bangor, Maine. Uh, but I've, I've just been in love with Egypt ever since I was a small child. It seems common in the field, though, because you know, I know your mentor, Barry Kemp, you know, he was a kid and his father was stationed in Egypt as a soldier in World War II and sent him photographs of the Tutankhamun exhibit. That's what inspired him. It seems like almost everybody in the field I've met wanted to do this as a child. Is there something about ancient Egypt that grabs kids? What is it, do you think? It may be the, the, the mummies, it may be the, uh, the, the gold, the treasure. I mean, that, that definitely connects with our, um, something deep in our, in our humanity. Yeah, I think from the age of four or five, I just started talking about Egypt, and my parents had no idea why. This is pre-internet, pre-cable. Um, something must have grabbed me. I'm sure I saw a National Geographic story, and that, and that did it. You have another family connection that I think is, is pretty fascinating. Your grandfather named Harold Young was a professor of forestry at the University of Maine, but he did some work in forestry that's connected with what you're doing here. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, so when my grandfather served in uh, World War II, he was part of the 101st Screaming Eagles. He jumped the day before D-Day. And at the time, the paratroopers were given what was considered state-of-the-art technology, so little aerial photos uh, of maps of the areas where they were jumping into folded up in their pockets. And that influenced him to start studying the field of aerial photography in forestry in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. And we sort of take this for granted now. You know, he'd look through a stereoscope, which is essentially like a, 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 a microscope with, that you, where you can put overlapping images to see them in 3D. And the reason I took my first remote sensing course was because of my grandfather. Uh, unfortunately, we'd lost him by the time I went to university, 
but I just thought, wow, you know, Grampy did this with forestry. I'm sure loads of people have done this for archaeology. I'm sure there's not much left to find in Egypt. So I'm really glad that I was wrong about that. Uh, but you know, it's, it's very much a family connection. I think of my grandfather often when I'm, I'm doing my work. I feel like he's with me. So you started uh, studying this as an undergrad, right? And so yes. what, was, you know, what was available then? And how did, how did somebody get into this? you know, at that time in terms of figuring out how to use these resources for archaeology? So there was a, an, a course at Yale called Observing the Earth from Space where you kind of learn the, the rudimentary physics and science of remote sensing. And at the time, uh, that there was no Google Earth, so we had to use NASA satellite images that were of a lower resolution. Um, so learning the techniques, learning how to interpret the imagery, um, and I really started getting into very high resolution satellite processing when I went to, to graduate school. But at the time, uh, the, the field really hadn't quite come into existence. There were a few dozen archaeologists who'd applied the technology to finding archaeological sites, but it was just at its beginning, so I, I feel very lucky to have studied it at the time I did. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to see quickly maybe one of these, one of these images. So I was wondering if you could show us, um, just to start, I think you've done some work on Tanis, um, in Egypt, and maybe you could show us what one of these images looks like and sort of what you're doing as a space archaeologist. Sure, let's see if I can. Oh. Can we get the image up on this screen? There we go. So yeah, so, so being, uh, being obsessed with Indiana Jones, of course I had to start by looking at Tanis. This is an archaeological site in the northeast Egyptian delta, about two, two and a half hours to the northeast of Cairo. And when you go to the site today, it's, it's sort of shaped like South America, tipped on its side. And archaeologists have been working there for probably about 110, 120 years, uh, French mission. They've mainly focused on the temple area, which is in the northern part of the site. Tanis was Egypt's capital for, uh, for several hundred years, for around 1, 000, from around 1000 BC. And when you walk around the old part of the settlement, which had never before been mapped, what you see is the image on your left. It's a flat brown mound. You're walking across it. It's very silty. It's very sandy. You can't see anything. So this is a very high resolution satellite image pre-processing. And in ancient Egypt, the houses were built out of mud bricks. So over time, as the mound rose, as the site degraded, um, the, the, the foundations are there, but we simply had no idea of the size and extent of the city. So we got high resolution imagery, we processed it. So this is the before image, and this is the after image. So this is an image taken from 400 miles in space. You can very clearly see the outlines of ancient buildings, potential palaces, and there are three distinct phases of construction at the site. So this is the power of the technology. It doesn't work this well at every site. Um, and I should say we're not seeing under, under the ground. We're seeing subtle hints of what's under the ground by how it's affected the overlaying soil. We got the image during a wet time of year. So in processing the satellite image using different parts of the light spectrum that we can't see, think of it almost like a, a space-based CAT scan that allows us to see all these very subtle variations. And we're processing the imagery, we're looking for these differences, and lo and behold, this is what you can see. Is that a river there that's moving, like an old river? Or what is the line that's going there? That's a, that's a road going through the site. So, so that's a, an ancient road? Uh, the, the, the very long, the, um, the black lines you see are modern roads that have sort of driven over the mm -hmm. ancient remains. That, that, that vertical one, what's that? Oh, the, oh, ver oh sorry, sorry. Yeah, so, so, the vertical, so the vertical lines you're seeing are old city streets. Um, so this is from around 3,000 years ago. And in the lower, um, I think it's to your uh, right-hand side, you'll see some bigger buildings. And those are probably the palaces of the kings who ruled from Tanis uh, in dynasties 22, 21 and 22 in ancient Egypt. Right, so this is revolutionary technology, but I, th I think actually the idea of looking at arche archaeological sites from the ground, from the sky, started quite early, right? I mean, was that, can you t t maybe introduce briefly sort of what, how people got this idea and what, what brought them to those early technologies? Sure, so I have an image here. Um, so this is a Corona high resolution space photograph. It's black and white, it was taken in the 1960s. Archaeologists started doing aerial photography in the early 1900s, the earliest, earliest sort of Aerial archaeology we have is from the site of Stonehenge with images taken from a balloon. But this image is from, um, from the site of, of Tabilla. What you're seeing is an enclosure wall. Um, so archaeologists started using all of this old data to, to be able to see sites, to be able to see features that they couldn't see before. And as more advanced technology became available, um, you're able to see more and more that you can't see in these earlier images. Mm -hmm. 
And so they were using balloons, and then I guess during World War, after World War One, they were using planes to map. Right. Yeah. So they switched switched to um, they switched to airplanes in World War One. What's really interesting is the, because archaeologists were used, they, they got commissioned as pilots during World War One, and they were flying over archaeological sites in Syria and Lebanon and, and taking pictures. So that actually helped to start um, Air Force reconnaissance units. So it's really the archaeologists that started aerial reconnaissance for the military, not the other way around. Oh, really? So yeah. it was the archaeologists who, yeah, that, that's fascinating. Um, and, um, you know, when you are looking from above, I think there's some features that you notice that you, you, that you describe them as called, cr they're crop marks. Can you explain what that is? Um, so um, there's an image here taken at an archaeological site in Italy called Portus. If you've ever flown into Rome's Fumicino Airport, as you're going over, you see this really interesting hexagonal basin. So this was Rome's ancient port, started under Emperor Trajan, expanded under Hadrian about 120, 126 AD. Um, and what happens is as these sites are buried over time, whether they're stone or made of mud brick, when you have vegetation on top and the roots grow into them, well, as soon as they hit that stone, those roots aren't gonna be able to absorb water as readily, and so looking in the near infrared part of the light spectrum, which is the part where vegetation reflects most strongly, you're able to see these outlines uh, where sometimes you can see them on the ground and sometimes you can't. So this is actually an amphitheater at the site of Portis that we found using infrared technology. This image was taken during a, a very dry period of time about five or six years ago in the fall in, uh, in, in, in Rome. And, and uh these images sometimes, I guess, or at least when they were using planes, they would do that in the early morning, or that's, what was the reason for that? So sometimes in the early, early morning, you get shading. Um, it's the best time of day to take uh, pictures on an archaeological site when you get this beautiful raking light casting shadows. So they, they would have done the same thing 80, 90 years ago. And also the, the moisture sometimes makes it different? Yes, yeah, so, so there's, there can be, as you know, a lot of moisture in the mornings before the sun bur burns it off. So it's the best time of day to take images anyway. So this was a... This amphitheater, was, in, is, was that a farm field? What is that field there? So, so these are a series of fields surrounding the site of Portus. And uh, Professor Simon Key of Southampton University has been working at the site for over 30 years. They've used all this amazing ground-based remote sensing technology, so magnetometry, ground-penetrating radar, to see under the ground. And sometimes it just takes applying the right type of technology in the right place. So they'd use other tools in this site, hadn't found anything in this particular area and essentially um, thought that maybe there, there wasn't anything here, but when we looked, and by the way, this amphitheater is about 40 meters across with, uh, with uh, eight-meter thick walls. You can clearly see eastern and western gates and roads. Professor Key was completely floored. Um, so I think they're, they're planning on doing work there in future. And what's the size of that circle there? Like right, so yeah, th 30, uh, excuse me, 40 meters across with eight meter thick walls. There would have been between six and eight levels of stairs. And this would have been, been the main entertainment point for, for this really amazing uh, trade point or, 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 or trade center in, in ancient Egypt, or ancient Rome. I call it the Amazon.com of ancient Rome. And, you know, so what's the, they have not yet excavated. Have they done test excavations or what's the status in terms of being on the ground at this site? They, they haven't been able to do excavations yet. So oftentimes in archaeology, we have challenges because, you know, we're, we can't just go and dig where we want. We have to work very carefully with governments. Um, this is private land owned by an individual, and they don't have the right to work there. So he has to proceed very carefully with negotiations. But I know he's very excited about it, and hopefully in the next few years he'll be able to excavate it. So they've been trying to negotiate with the farmer. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is, you discover this from space with satellite technology, but it still comes down to the farmer and getting him to agree to the... Yeah, and I don't think he's happy because in, in Italy, if there's a site of major archaeological importance on your land, the government can take it. So I'm very sorry, farmer. I didn't mean to find it. It just showed up. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's fascinating because it seems like there's often this technology runs into the same political issues that we run into at any, any level of work, right? I mean, right. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, these, the sort of the, the, the class, the different types of images that you started using, like these ones I mentioned, like Corona and all those, can you tell us about when those were shot and then how they became accessible to you um, and to other archaeologists? Like, when were those images made and then, you know, because they originally were spy images. It's not something that the average person or the average archaeologist could access. So, talk, so maybe explain a little bit that history. In the 1960s and, and 
70s, really sort of 50s through early 70s. Of course, that was the height of the Cold War. Um, and the US government was very interested in what Russia was doing and what other countries were doing uh, across Eastern Europe. And so they sent up these rockets to drop canisters that took pictures um, that would then be collected by airplanes. And what's amazing about images like the corona images is they preserve landscapes from 50 to 60 years ago that simply aren't there anymore. So many archaeological sites are gone because of development, because of urbanization. Um, and, and they became available uh, under US President Bill Clinton in 1995. He made them freely available to all archaeologists, or really everyone, of course, not just archaeologists. And now you can get those images online for virtually nothing. So they, were, they had balloons that were up, and then they shot pictures as they were descending. And then a plane would catch those things? Correct. That's amazing. And, and then, so what pushed Clinton to make these available in 1995? What was I, it? I think, you know, at the time, um, the U.S. had some very early high-resolution satellite sensors, so the images were no longer sensitive. Um, they could easily be released. The U.S. didn't particularly care about people knowing what landscapes were like 40 years beforehand. Mm -hmm. But before 1995, the archaeologists were not able to use these things? No, archaeologists were restricted to lower resolution images um, from, from NASA and other satellites. Satellites that had a resolution of 15 meters, 20 meters per pixel. So roughly the size of this room. And then um, in 2008, I think there was another big decision made Can, the, by NASA. So what, what's amazing, so before, before uh, 2008, when I was doing my, my undergrad and then my PhD, you had to buy images from NASA. And they made this extraordinary and very generous decision to free up tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, of satellite images to the whole world for free. They're all available uh, online. And what's amazing is there's a record of the Earth taken from space from NASA going back to 1972. So in terms of mapping things like climate change, changes in ocean temperatures, uh, changes in landscapes, changes in population, it's a really amazing resource that, that we have, and it's free. And where does somebody go to look at this stuff? Where do you so go? Just go to, go to nasa.gov or Google NASA satellite images, and you can, um, you can look for yourself. Also, NASA has a wonderful online platform um, called Globus, where you can go and, and look at these images over time and sort of scan for, for yourself and see how, the, how much the Earth has changed. And you know, I understand from your book, too, that part of what makes the time, so these are kind of like a time capsule also, as you said, because they're from 72 and from the 60s and 70s, these images. Um, but that's particularly important to have in the developing world, right? In countries like India and, and in the Middle East, all over. And, and, and why is that so critical? So, uh, you know, prior, prior to major development going on, um, sort of in the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s, you know, we, we have these vestiges of old landscapes. So, especially in countries like Egypt, uh, with the Aswan High Dam being constructed in the 1960s, after it was constructed, urbanization in Egypt just exploded. And so many sites there in Syria and Iraq and India and, and all over the world uh, just just have been um, destroyed or bulldozed or lost to urbanization or under, or under modern towns. So it's essential for us to have this record of what sites used to look like. Can you, but, uh, when these sites get developed, I assume you can no longer access them, right? It's just, you're just seeing what was there or what? You, you can still see hints or traces and sometimes bits of sites are um, still partly available to archaeologists under modern towns. But yeah, unfortunately, so many, so many of these sites are, are, are gone. I mean, nothing is, never, nothing is ever totally gone. I'm sure archaeologists in the future will be able to dig through layers of modern cities to get to the properly ancient cities. But for now, most of them aren't accessible to archaeologists. Right. And you know, looking at this image again, I guess the shapes that you look for, I think you mentioned that straight lines do not occur in nature. I assume a circle like that. What are the kind of things that you look for when you're going over these images that jump out at you that say, this is not natural formation or... Right. So actually, it's, this is a funny story. So when I first uh, looked at this image, I dismissed uh, this feature because it was so clear and so round and so perfect. I thought it was something like a modern water tank. Um, I thought this can't just be an amphitheater in the middle of, of nowhere. So when we're looking for these sites for these features, what we do in archaeology is we go from the known to the unknown. So wherever we're studying, we look at previous excavation reports, surveys, no, well-known archaeological sites and features, and we use that information to inform us as we're looking at these sites. Because the best pattern recognition tool on planet Earth isn't a computer, it's our eyes. 
And human eyes are great at picking out sights on images. And so really, that's what we look for. We look for things that are sort of at an odd angle. You see that the angle of the road doesn't match up at all to the modern farmlands or the modern farm boundaries. Mm. Another thing that, that features prominently in your work is a technology called LIDAR. Um, and this had a big impact in, in Central America. I was wondering if you could explain to us what that is and why it's so important. So the, the big challenge we have when we're working in areas with dense forest or rainforest, whether it's Central America, whether it's Cambodia, whether it's trees across the US and Canada, is satellites can't see through trees. Trust me, I've, I've tried, it doesn't work. Uh, and what, what LIDAR is, it's a sensor system flown in an airplane that sends for light detection and ranging. You can fly it on a drone or a helicopter as well. And it sends down millions of pulse beams of light that allow archeologists and scientists to create point cloud models. So millions and millions of points. And you can essentially remove the overlaying vegetation. And what you're left with is a ground elevation model. And my colleagues, Francesco Estrada Belli uh, and Marcelo Canuto at Tulane University have done this amazing project with colleagues mapping over 2,000 square kilometers uh, in Guatemala, parts of Mexico, parts of Belize. They have found tens of thousands of previously unknown archaeological sites. What you're looking at here is uh, their image from the site of Tikal which was a major, major Maya site. And all of you probably know Tikal because it was the rebel base in uh, the last Star Wars. Um, so features in, in, in modern memory as well. And what's extraordinary is at this one site alone, they found 60,000 new features. And within the next five to 10 years, we're probably going to get a complete map of the ancient Maya world. I mean, this is amazing. In 2020, we have the possibility of mapping an entire civilization. That's why this technology is so sort of transformative and groundbreaking. It's allowing us, it's not just about the sites you find, it's allowing us to ask big new questions of, of where these people were and why societies rose and collapsed. And I, I guess some of these Mayan sites are unique because there's nobody living there now, so they have not been destroyed by subsequent habitation, is that correct? That's right, they're, they're beneath dense, uh, dense rainforest tracks in the heart, yeah, in the, in the heart of Guatemala and, and elsewhere in Central America. In your book you describe, you know, somebody who had worked here for 30 years and he gets the first series of images from this, right? And then he says it just transformed everything, right? I mean, what was the, put that in context for us, like what that meant to him. So, so there are these legendary archaeologists named Diane and Arlen Chase and they'd been working at the site of Caracol, which is an incredibly important Maya site for 30 years. And their colleague, who's a friend of mine, uh, Professor John Weishample, said, hey, I've got this funding. Um, you know, I'd love to use LIDAR to see what I can see at, at your site. And they said, yeah, you're not going to find anything new. We've mapped everything. We've worked here for 30 years. So John uh, was able to collect LIDAR working with a company, and when he presented that information to, uh, to the chases, um, Arlen stayed up all night looking at the imagery because he'd never seen anything like it before. And, they've, and now they are starting to go into these sites? Is that what's been happening since? Yes, yeah, so they and, and my colleagues have visited many hundreds of these new sites on the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and there's excavations going on now about, with these things? Yes. Yeah. Um, and what, you know, some of the other, what are some of the other new tools? We've seen this LIDAR, the satellite, you know, photographs. What, what are some other modern contemporary high-tech tools that we're using in archaeology now that have changed the field in the last couple decades? So there's so much now that we can do um, using, uh, using our phones. So now on archaeological sites, uh, we're taking hundreds of pictures every day on our phones. And just from a simple app, we can create very good 3D models of excavation areas or, 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 or um, objects that we find. We are using new dating tools, new dating techniques, so dating is getting more precise. Uh, we're also using more chemical testing. So one of, one of my colleagues has figured out a technique with, with your tooth plaque. Um, she's scraping ancient tooth plaque and she's able to reconstruct ancient diseases. Who knew that um, us going to the dentist would prevent problems for future archeologists? But anyway, all, all these tools keep being developed and all these amazing new discoveries keep, keep happening. And, and there have been a lot of revolutions in terms of what bioarchaeology can do, correct? I mean, like, I think you, you describe also what you notice from a skeleton. You gave the example of a left arm on a, on a, uh, on a, a female skeleton. Can you walk us through that and tell us what the te technology ta teaches us? So at the site of uh, Tel Tabella, which is a project that my husband, Greg Mumford, uh, ran for a number of years, we excavated a number of burials 
and on one of the burials of a woman, we found incredibly large uh, processes on her left upper arm, which is where the big, uh, where the biceps would have attached. And we wondered why, you know, why is she doing particular exercises with her left hand that's not with her right? The answer was right in front of us the whole time. There are these amazing women from the village and they help us remove the dirt on the excavation site and they put the dirt in the basket, they put it on their heads and they walk like this. And if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, there's an image of a woman from 4,000 years ago doing the same thing. So the answers are often right in front of you. You don't always have to go into the ground to look. And it's amazing what hasn't changed in thousands of years. Yeah, and I, th I think that also, I mean, we have this idea of archaeology from space and high technology. Of course, you've, you're working on the ground. But you also, I know from talking to people, that you also need, do need to be very attentive to what locals tell you and to these local traditions, like the way people, you know, are doing things is sometimes not that different, right? I mean, that you... And, and, and what else do you learn from local people in the villages around sites? What are some other critical things you learn? So we work often with farmers who, um, who are really, really good at working in the soil. They're experts. This is what they've been doing their whole lives. Um, so they'll often be able to tell us where archaeological sites are on survey. Not everything shows up from space. I'm an evangelist for the technology, but also recognize its limitations. And I've been on survey all over Egypt and spoken to farmers uh, who probably uh, never finished never finished the sixth grade, and I get into lengthy discussions with them about Roman period pottery. Um, you know, they tell me, "Oh, this site is Roman. How do you know? Well, because of the ridging on the pottery. Who taught you that? Well, it's just known." So I, I think archaeologists have a lot more work to do in terms of respecting this local knowledge. Um, you know, there's so many uh, there's so many things that are done in Egypt today that are c continuations of things that have been done for, for thousands of years. So it's something we you know we take very seriously, and my colleagues do too. Right. It, it, thinking again about the political realities on the ground, this image, as you said, was, was from a place that's not inhabited, but most places are not like that. Um, and in Egypt. Um, you know, the Arab Spring began in, two, in, two, in 2011. It had a huge impact on a lot of sites. And you've done work with sort of some of the looting um, and the things that happened in, in the wake of that. I was wondering if you could talk to us about that. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, sort of post-Arab Spring with the breakdown of security, not just in Egypt, but in Iraq and Syria and so many other places, um, there's a big uptick in site looting. But all these rumors were flying around about where the looting was happening and how it was happening. So we were very lucky with, with support from National Geographic and Digital Globe, which is now Maxar Technologies, the company that provides high-resolution imagery uh, that I use. Uh, we got amazing images taken a few weeks after the Arab Spring kicked off, and I had images from the end of 2010. So we compared the before and the after, and we saw looting at sites like Saqqara, sites like Dashur, we realized it was an issue, and so over the next two years, we developed a project um, to map archaeological site looting across Egypt. So we looked at data from 2002 to 2013. We mapped over 200,000 looting pits. And by the way, this is what a looting pit looks like. It's very easy to, to, to see it once you've seen it once. It's a square where the looters have gone into a tomb surrounded by a donut shape of earth. Um, and it... Over time, as we crunched the numbers, if we started to figure out kind of what, what was happening, why the story was always the looting got worse after the Arab Spring. But we cross-referenced the numbers against tourism, uh, youth unemployment, and inflation. And what we found is looting was pretty stable in Egypt between 2002 and 2008. It started to get bad in 2009 and 2010 with the global recession. So I think one of the reasons looting got so bad in, in Egypt and Syria and Iraq wasn't because of the Arab Spring, it was because it was already bad due to global recession. Uh, so, so this had already started, and, yeah. and, and we, just be, we just focused on it after the Arab Spring. That's right. And so, but what can you do? So you got these images, you know, and I, I assume, so what's happening in the image, what's the difference between the red and the black there? What's... So this is an archaeological site in the Egyptian Delta, and probably about 65 to 70% of the site has been looted. So you see what the looting pits look like in the image on your right. And we went through and we numbered and we, we drew little polygons around all the looting pits to count them, to get a sense of where are they looting, how are they looting, what time periods are they looting to get a, a much bigger picture of what sites um, were, were threatened. And of course, we share this information uh, with the Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt. 
And, and the red, what's that, the difference with red and the black? So I'm yeah, sure. but the red, the red are dots, little polygons that we, we put on the images in a, in a big geospatial map to get a sense of the number to, to allow us to keep track. And yeah, the, image, the other image you see, it's an actual looting pit at the site where uh, I work in a joint mission with the Egyptian government called Lish. You can see that this is a shaft tomb, so it would have gone down between 10 and 15 meters. There could be multiple tombs off the shaft. Um, and the looters know exactly where to go. They hardly ever get it wrong. And in this case, they broke through the mud brick over the tomb to get down. So this tomb was actually intact prior to the looters going in. Um, they're after coffins, statues, shabtis, jewelry, anything that they can get their hands on. Uh-huh. And so what's, what was the recourse? I mean, what, what did your technology lead? Have, has, has, have, were they able to apply this in any way? What were they able to do with this? So we used this information um, to set up a project. I think the image isn't there. That's okay. So we used this information um, to set up a project at, at the site of Lisht where uh, it was one of the worst hit sites post-Arab Spring with looting. It's this extraordinary site. It's, it's ancient Egypt's Middle Kingdom capital. It dates to about 3,800 years ago. We don't know very much about that period of time compared to, say, ancient Egypt's uh, Great Pyramid Age or its Imperial Age, the New Kingdom. Uh, and, the, and the actual capital hasn't been discovered yet. So that's really what drew me to the site of Lish to start work was seeing all this looting from space. Can you show us Lish? I think you have some images yep. from there. Um, so this is a tomb of a gentleman named Intef after our 2017 season. So we've been working with the Ministry of Antiquities since 2015. And what you're looking at, it's called a T-shaped tomb because it's shaped like the letter T. The tomb would have originally been roofed and had a series of columns supporting it. But over time, um, the tomb has been quarried into. There have been earthquakes. And we didn't know what we would find when we started work at the site. We thought the tomb had been completely looted. We thought there was nothing left. So what you're looking at with the iron gray cover is the tomb of Intef himself. We still have to go back and do excavation work. But I want to show you the quality of the art from Lish. This is probably Intef. This is moments after the, uh, the, the sculpture came out of the ground. Uh, two years ago, and you can see the, the brightness of the paint. It looks like it was painted yesterday. The Middle Kingdom was the, the high period of Egyptian art and architecture and literature, and the kings of, of the Middle Kingdom capital called Ichtawi supported these craftsmen to do this very fine art. So we found hundreds of fragments just like this while excavating in the tomb and also getting information about, about Entef himself. Thinking about these looters, are they using technology? What technologies are they using? How are they finding stuff that people, you know, because I visited, when I was reporting on sites, there was, it was happening all over the place. Um, but I'm curious what you've noticed. So I get emails occasionally um, from people who I think are looters asking me for help. You know, hey, I found this site on Google Earth. Is this a site? And of course, I never respond. I collect the names and share them with the appropriate authorities. Uh, never a good idea to email someone uh, working on, on looting like this. Uh, so yeah, they're using Google Earth. I've heard rumors that um, they're using ground-based remote sensing tools, some of the more high-tech projects. But also, these are people that are experts in landscapes. These are people that understand where tombs are. So they're, they're incredibly precise when they go to excavate. Um, and you can see a lot of these tombs and features uh, really, really clearly first thing in the morning. So they just, they just know where to go. Yeah. And um, so, so some of them are actually even using these satellite technologies as well. Some of the looters are doing that. Do you show images to the locals there. Do, 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 have you ever shown them the, the images from space and, and, and how do they react? So yeah, we, we of course we'll, we have a local workforce. We work with 60 to 7 people from the village of Lisht and a number of them uh, were involved in the site looting, like so many people living next to archaeological sites and they've become the site's best protectors. You know, working with us, we take time to explain things to them. Whenever kids come to the site, we don't shoo them away because it's their heritage. It's not our heritage. We're very lucky to to work there and it's our job as archaeologists to communicate the importance of the site and now um, instead of having to rely on, on looting, you know, we come every year, we excavate, we, we provide them with really good salaries. Um, I pay, my team and I pay for year-round guards at the site. They understand the value um, and, and they understand that there's long-term potential that maybe someday this site will be turned into a tourist site, which is a much better long-term investment than looting. 
one thing I remember, you know, at, at the site of Amarna where your teacher Barry Kemp uh, works, there's a book about that from somebody who worked there in the 1930s. I think it's called Nefertiti Slept Here, a young woman who was working with the British excavation. And one thing that struck me when I read that is that she describes women working on the site, on the dig. Their workers included women. And then when I read that, I was like, there's no way they would allow that nowadays. You can't, I mean, in the Delta, there's some, some places where women work. But in Upper Egypt, that's ended, you know. And so I, I sometimes wonder, like, you have the, this technology improved so much, but we see uh, sometimes even social realities are retrenching. Do you ever feel this sort of tension, or do you get, does this frustrate you sometimes, that there's so much promise, but we still see on the ground issues like this? Yeah, I mean, certainly where we look at Lisht, it's, it's primarily men that work um, as, as excavators or, or skilled archaeologists. Uh, the women help with more, more things that are more traditionally associated with women. They help with the cooking, they help with cleaning on site. Um, but I, I've been very lucky to run a field school and help mentor some young women who are archaeologists with the Ministry of Antiquities, and that's very, very slowly changing. Uh, but your point about the, the book from the 1930s, um, it, it shares this amazing story. You know, I, I mentioned before these long traditions, how things last. Uh, at the end of that excavation season, uh, the author Mary Chubb talks about this huge party that it was held, and it's tradition at the end of a dig season, you have something called a fantasia, they slaughter a goat, there's dancing, there's music, there's celebration. This hasn't changed in 150 years of excavation in Egypt. And she tells the story at the end of their season, and by the way, this is within, within living memory, certainly when I was an undergrad, of the village headman coming in and telling this extraordinary story of a husband and wife, and things were going pretty well for them, but the, the husband's brother got incredibly jealous, and in a fit of rage, he murdered the brother, he cut up the, the brother into pieces and buried them to where the, the wife, the bereaved wife, had to find him and put him back together, and he sprang back to life. And what Mary realized as she was hearing this story in 1930 is the resurrection story of Osiris from 4,000 years before. So th the past is there. We just have to look and listen a little bit differently. Yeah, it's, it's that's amazing. You talked, you, you mentioned about sort of the colonial model, I mean, archaeology sort of does have this colonial model in many places, although it really varies so much. Like when I was in China, they would never let foreigners run digs or do the kind of work that they do in Egypt. Um, e Egypt, of course, is, is a place where Westerners did a lot, all of the early work, and they continue to do a lot of work there. But do you see this changing, and how do you feel, you know, as a Westerner working there? In, in terms of this issue? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very sensitive to it. So obviously, you know, archaeology, anthropology, Egyptology ha have long uh, colonial histories. Um, and I think with colonialism, you take and to decolonize is to give. So when we work in Egypt, it's a joint mission. We have equal numbers of Egyptian and Western participants. Of course, we can't work there without the kind permission of the Ministry of Antiquities. Um, and so we spend a lot of time when we're working there doing training. So showing local archaeologists how to use these new tools, these new technologies. On um, the Ministry of Antiquities, uh, when, they, when you apply to do a field school, you say, you know, I'm going to teach how to do excavation or survey or mapping. And, and this is really helping to change the con conversation. I'm sure all of you have seen these extraordinary discoveries made in Egypt in the last number of months. Dozens of new coffins from Luxor, a new workman's village close to the Valley of the Kings, a new pyramid from Saqqara. These are discoveries made by these brilliant young Egyptian archaeologists that have gotten training uh, and, and now the Ministry of Antiquities is helping to support and, and fund them. So it shows you what sort of what is possible um, with, with outreach, with training, and it's, it's my job as someone who's so lucky to be doing the things she wanted to do ever since she was five years old, um, to think about how do we give back, how do we empower, and not just take information and leave at the end of a season. And speaking of that, I mean, you, you won the, the, the TED Prize, so you won a million dollars, um, and you were able to apply that to what you, you know, to, to an idea that you had. Um, and I think your idea is connected with this, this concept of making sure that archaeology is something that, that the people of the site, in the site, who live there are invested in it as well. Can you talk to us about what you've done with, with, with that prize? So with the TED Prize, I set up an organization and a platform called Global Explore. 
Uh, it's an online citizen archaeology project that allows anyone in the world to look at satellite images and help us find archaeological sites. And this seemed like a completely wild preposition when we started it in 2017. We had no idea if it would work. We had no idea if people would use it. Um, and we set it up for people between 5 and 95 to use because for too long, archaeology has been for very privileged, predominantly white men. And we must change this narrative. We must make space to, to include the voices and stories and, and passion of so many talented people from around the world. And so to date, we've had over 100,000 users from 120 countries. Thank you. Um, they've helped us to map almost 30,000 potential archaeological features in Peru. Over 700 of them have been considered major sites. We're partnering with the Ministry of Culture in Peru. They've helped lead to the discovery of new Nazca lines. And I have to share the story. So I said at the beginning, you know, we wanted this platform to be for everyone between sort of 5 and 95. And one of our top super users is a 93-year-old woman from Cleveland, Ohio, named Doris May Jones. I, I love her. She's wonderful. So what, what you're looking at here is what, what the platform looks like. And one of the questions I most often get asked is, well, if you're showing these images and you're showing where sites are and people are going and marking looting or marking where sites might be, you know, isn't that just information for the looters? And you can see in the image here, there's no mapping information and there's no GPS information. The only information you get is a 300 by 300 meter satellite image and you mark, is there something, is there not something? You take a tutorial, that's it. The only people who get the information are archeologists working in that country. And something I'm so excited to be able to share with all of you at the Jaipur Literary Festival is after Peru, we are coming to India. So the, so the user gets a randomly assigned quadrant, basically, and then there's, they don't know where that is. Right. All they know is that they're somewhere in Peru, and when we launch later this year, they'll be somewhere in Gujarat or, or another state in India. And, and so what are you planning to do in India with this? What's, how will it work here? So we're working in very close partnership with the Archaeological Survey of India. They have asked us specifically to help them with site mapping. Um, you know, India has such an extraordinarily rich history, Muslims, Mughals, uh, Indus Valley, uh, the Chola culture, there, there's so much here. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, I think, of archaeological sites here. And with so much development going on, not just in India, but around the world, you know, we have a, a, a limited window to map these sites and get a sense of where they are before they're gone. So, so the ASI um, will be getting all this information. We're also doing capacity building. We're developing a new geospatial wing at the ASI. We're going to be training some of the best minds there. Thank you. Um, we're also focusing on site sustainability. So for, for, for too long, um, archaeologists have been the ones with, with the power and knowledge to go in and work on sites, and that's fine, except like we've seen at Lisht, the best culture heroes, the best guardians of the past are the people living there who've lived there for thousands of years. So in working with local communities, we want to empower them with this technology. It's going to be on, on Androids, on iPhones. It will be available to everyone. They can be the ones who safeguard their, their heritage as well. So we have a lot of plans. We're very excited. We'll be launching probably in August or September of this year. So please, and by the way, the platform's free. It's for everyone, for the kids that are here. Um, we're hoping to work with, with local schools. Uh, so don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. It's globalexplorer.org. Uh, please get in contact with us if we can share anything with you. So, something else that strikes me, and you know, when I look at your work, I mean, usually archaeologists are very focused on a specialty. You don't, you're not a global archaeologist, um, but in a sense, you are to some degree because space doesn't have the boundaries, right? And so, you've you've helped on projects with you know Viking burials, and you've looked for Vikings in New Newfoundland. It has nothing to do with our, with Egypt. Um, and, and you know you're meeting with, with, with people tomorrow in India, correct? About the, about your project here. So is this going to change the field in that sense? Are there going to be new archaeologists whose specialty is this kind of technology that runs across boundaries and borders? Traditional. So our our goal with Global Explorer, as audacious as it might sound, is to map the entire world. 
And we want to get millions and millions of people across the world using this platform. You know, I, I, I see how much archaeology was impacted by a simple Hollywood movie with a dude wearing a fedora. You know, can you imagine what the field of archaeology and history and art history uh, and, and geography will be like when kids have the opportunity to go on and use the platform and they're making genuine scientific contributions? So our ultimate goal isn't just to map the world, but to help governments move the needle in terms of how they prioritize culture. You know, culture seems to fall last in any government funding program. It doesn't matter where in the world you look. But when you see that, that archaeological sites are, are endless banks where you can develop sites for tourism, people want to keep coming again and again and again. They're inspired. They experience wonder when they visit them. So that's ultimately our goal. Our, our goal is to map the world and, and help the world find some wonder again with everything going on, with the rise of nationalism, Globally, you know, I think uh, we're hoping the platform can bring people together and get it to understand, get the world to understand that its, its richness, its great diversity, has made us who we are, and that needs to be celebrated. And and not um, and you know, we simply can't have nationalism any, anymore. We need to celebrate great diversity. So I want to open it up to questions, but first, one, one final thing. You mentioned the fedora, so what's it like having lunch with the Harrison Ford? <laughs> that was very unexpected. Um, you, you never think you're going to get to meet um, your, your hero from when you were a small child. I will say that Mr. Ford is actually more handsome in person than he is on screen. Um, that was something that, that Ted very graciously organized. He was so kind. He was so generous. Um, and I wanted to thank him. I wanted him to understand the impact that he'd had on the field of archaeology. And when I met him, I said, Mr. Ford, of course, it's an honor to meet you. And I want you to understand that the reason I stood on that TED stage today and made this wish and I'm inviting in people from around the world to help experience this great sense of wonder and discovery is because you inspired me as a child. Uh, and, and you inspired hundreds and hundreds of my colleagues. Uh, and he had no idea that he had inspired a whole generation of archaeologists. So it was a gift, you know, the gift was his character. And he looked at me, he goes, you know, that, that was a movie character, I'm not real. Uh, and I said, well, clearly you are real. You know, it's, it's your spirit that infused the character, and it's your spirit that inspired me. Uh, and I, of course, couldn't help myself. I brought a fedora, and there is actually a picture of us fighting over it that I don't think I can ever share. That's great. Uh, let's go ahead and have questions from the audience. Uh, I think we have a microphone, so you can start with you there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Peter, Sarah. Uh, I have a question. Like, will uh, space will be the next frontier for archaeology? So I have a chapter in my book um, that talks about what archaeology will be like in 100 years. And I don't want to spoil it for you, uh, but the same tools and technologies that we're developing looking back here on Earth, I think we can use it to look outward to other planets. Um, you know, NASA just had its announcement for its 2020 class of astronauts. And unfortunately, they do not allow you to apply if you are a social scientist or an archaeologist. So I think this is a, a travesty. You know, I think, uh, I think we should be thinking about how we're going to explore these sites long term because, you know, I know astronauts are trained in, in, in exploration, in geology, but the only people on this planet that understand how to reconstruct a civilization from scratch are archaeologists. So hopefully, um, with, with what we're trying to get people to do on Global Explorer, you know, maybe your, your 10th or 20th great-grandchild will be the one that helps to map civilizations on other worlds. Hi. Um, good afternoon. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, Sarah, who today funds archaeological research? I imagine this technology is very expensive, so is it public, private, philanthropy, universities? You mentioned National Geographic. So that's my first question. My second question, and maybe Peter, you can answer. Again, in China, the tomb of Qin Qing Huangdi uh, in uh, Xi'an still has not been discovered. Is it political, like we heard some rumors about? And will we ever see uh, discover the tomb of Qin Qing Huangdi? 
So archaeology is funded by a variety of sources. Um, so sometimes, like with the Archaeological Survey of India, it's funded by the government. Uh, the, the funding that I get is from National Science Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Geographic. But archaeologists are having to rely more and more on private donors just because the government has cut so many funds to, um, to excavation. So at Global Explorer, we're funded by a variety of things, grants, uh, corporate, uh, corporate uh, foundations. The Tata Trust is very generously funding us here in India, for which we're, we're so grateful. So yeah, we, we try to cobble it together from wherever we can. And of course, we're all, we're all looking behind our couch for quarters because we'll take every, every bit of funding that we can find. And, and you know, we, you asked about the Qin Shi Huang tomb. The, Qin Shi Huang is the first emperor in China, the one who unified the country um, 2,000 years ago. They know exactly where the tomb is, right? I mean, it's a mound. You can go. Walk in the, I've talked to people there, and they say, "Well, no, we can't excavate it because our technology is not advanced enough," um, which doesn't make any sense. If you've been to China, especially over the last 20 years, you can see that they, they want to excavate that. They could, but they're afraid. There's a superstition about it, um, and so it's a, it's a reminder that. The political forces are more powerful than any technology. It's, it's sort of like the fort that Sarah showed us that you see this perfect amphitheater. We know it's there, but there's a farmer, one farmer, who is keeping us from excavating that. Um, and these political, that's always the balance that, you, that, you're, that you're working with. I mean, I'm, doing, I'm a journalist, so I'm, I'm not like Sarah. I'm not on the ground like her, but, but she's constantly, you're, uh, somebody in her position that has to negotiate these political realities as well. Um, yeah, let's have somebody from the front there again. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Parkak. You know, it's quite phenomenal that we are all witness to this revolutionary fusion of this technology with the past. And I, I'll take my question from there. Do you think that when we fuse the past with the future, and, uh, you know, archaeology and history are perceived as dead subjects, taught like dead subjects, is something like the platform that you created, Global Explorer, is it creating the, uh, is, it, is it making the past more accessible to, you know, to, to a larger audience, to, to youth like me? You know, India, what Indiana Jones was to you, I think you are very much to me, so, yeah. That's, that's the nicest thing anyone has said to me in, in a while, thank you. I, I, you're absolutely right, I think, um, as I said, you know, for so long, archeology span just hasn't been accessible. You, you, you have to be so privileged to, to go on these expeditions to be able to travel and have all this training. And what I wanted to do was just destroy all ceilings to allow, uh, to create something where everyone can participate. You know, I, I remember the first time um, I flew in over the pyramids of, of Giza and just looking down uh, and, and feeling this amazing sense of, of wonder, uh, which I get every time I go to the pyramids today. And, and earlier last week, I had the opportunity to go to the Taj Mahal. Um, and I had no idea how much seeing the Taj in person would affect me emotionally. I actually cried. It was, I, I, I can't, just the wonder, the awe, the, the overwhelming respect that, that seeing that monument in person created me for the brilliant architects and artisans that lived hundreds of years ago. And while it's not always easy to travel to archaeological sites, you get that same sense of wonder and excitement when you look at satellite images and you get to help find sites. You know, we've had letters from teachers and, and, and kids and people from all over the world that have talked about what going on Global Explorer and helping us find sites has meant to them. I'll, nearly all of them say we wanted to be archaeologists as kids but couldn't. It didn't seem like a realistic career option. Um, so, so that's really the gift that we want to give the world. We want to give the world this gift of wonder. Because when you experience wonder, you feel, you, you recognize that the world is much bigger than you. And when you see that, you have empathy. And when you have empathy, you have connection. And when you have connection, you understand that it truly takes a global village to create the world. And we need to celebrate the great achievements of the people that came before us. That's the energy that I want to take into 2020 and beyond. We have somebody from the back, somebody toward the back, yeah. Uh, how would you correlate uh, mythology and archaeology? Like, uh, are they interrelated, or like any specifications about them? Like, so, so myth mythology. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, in in, in so many myths, of course, there's a kernel of truth. 
Um, so when, great, when sites are mentioned, when gods or goddesses are mentioned, when places are mentioned, I mean, these are sacred and it doesn't matter whether you're looking at myths or, or, or uh, f concepts of, of the beginning of the world from whether it's Judaism or Christianity or, or, or being Muslim or Hindu, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, or from ancient cultures. We have to uh, study the myths very, very carefully and look at all these sites and places they've mentioned, uh, because in so many cases, you know, we archaeologists work in the places that are mentioned in these myths, and we uncover a part of what we see in those myths. We see a bit of it as true, and to understand that and to fuse them together is, is really essential. So yeah, I think mythology, early religion um, is, is essential to study when we're doing this type of work. We have the other one right there? Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, had myth been a reality in any of your excavations or any of your projects uh, in the past? Um, so, yeah, so, so the, the image I showed you um, in, in the first, uh, first high-resolution corona image, so not myth per se, but uh, a story from Herodotus. And what Herodotus talked about was how the emperor Artaxerxes, the leader Artaxerxes III, came from Persia in 343 BC and attacked the city of Ronefer, which is ancient Egyptian for beautiful mouth. Um, so it was the name of the, of the site of Tel Tabela, which would have been on the Mendesian branch of the Nile over 2,000 years ago. Uh, and it was said that the temple was ransacked and that the site was largely destroyed. And what we were able to do with following the outline of the enclosure wall around the temple, we excavated in a corner and we found this really interesting dense concentration of debris and brick, about a meter and a half tall. And as we carefully excavated and pulled that away, we started finding tiny bronze fittings and bits of semi-precious stone. And actually, uh, I had about a, a, a quarter of a sandwich bag full of gold leaf. And we wondered, what the heck is going on? This is very, very strange. So the story that we were able to put together, and I think it matches really well with, with the archaeology and the story and the satellite imagery, is in 343 BC, Artaxerxes did come to Tel Tabilla. And when his soldiers came through, the first thing they would have done was to ransack the temple, take the golden idols out, they threw them in the corner, and set them on fire. So sometimes in archaeology, you are lucky enough to capture a moment in time, even if it's from hundreds of miles in space. But that's, that's pretty rare. I think we have time for one more question. So let's have the one there, please. Uh, hi. Uh, well, uh, right here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I'm uh, going to graduate in physics in a few couple of months. So I wanted to ask, do physicists have a place in your team, in your archaeology team? Or how exactly can physicists help you? In uh, please, please, I am. I uh, I really struggled with the physics part of the remote sensing class. So please, any any help you can give. I mean, the the physics of remote sensing is so important because it's it's essentially the language of light. How is the light reflecting or being refracted? off the Earth's surface interacting with satellites and how do you interpret that in such a way to make as much as possible appear? Because with satellite imagery, um, you're not just going and saying, I want an image of Tannis, and you get the image and you process it and like magic, it appears. It's a really careful study that goes into any work we do anywhere in the world. So the temporal nature of the imagery um, is, what are the ground conditions like? What is the geology like? Is the image from a wet time of year, dry time? of year. What techniques do we need to process the satellite imagery? So I've been very lucky uh, to, to get some great advice from, from uh, physicists in terms of really understanding what's going on in an image because so much of what we see can be ambiguous. And that's, what, that's one of the things I love about the field of remote sensing. It pulls in together physicists and geologists and geographers and archaeologists and you have this amazing community of, of like-minded scientists um, you know, one of the great things that I, I, I love as well is from space you can't see any, any borders, as Peter said. And so I think eventually what happens when you look at satellite imagery is you get something called the overview effect, which is what happens to astronauts in the space station. They see the world as a unified and connected whole rather than a series of areas with boundaries. So that's ultimately what I want to do with Global Explorer is, is hopefully the overview effect will spread like wildfire and we'll stop seeing ourselves in these countries separated 
celebrated and start seeing just how connected we all really are. I, I, I hope that everybody uh, goes to the Global Explorer websites and, and takes a look at that and participates. I'd also encourage you to go to the NASA, NASA websites and, and mess around with that stuff. Um, Sarah's going to be signing her book in the book signing tent af after the event. Um, I want to uh, thank so much to Sarah for coming all the way to Jaipur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. We wish to thank Sarah Parkak and Peter Hessler for a fascinating conversation. Both of them will be uh, signing copies of their book at their book signing desk located outside Durbar Hall on the left. So I do encourage you to go there and get their books. Thank you.